Good morning. morning. Happy Easter and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to those of you gathered here at Second Christian and those of you who are gathering with us on Facebook Live. We are so glad you have chosen to start your Easter Sunday off with us here at Second Christian. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. One more time. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Friends, we gather here as disciples, as seekers, as sojourners to celebrate the good news of the gospel on this special day. The gospel tells us that death does not have the last word, that love wins. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, no matter who you love or where you are connecting from, you are welcome here. So welcome one and all to this service of worship and happy Easter to each and every one of you. We are so pleased to have Brett DeShane here with us today with his trumpet to help us celebrate the good news of Christ's resurrection. Today, we conclude a special worship series based on the book Good Enough by Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie, thus the latter that is before us. And we once again thank Cassie Barron for her creativity in helping to create these worship installations and to Melissa and Alan Robinson and Kathy Rooney who assembled all of these beautiful flowers here today. And those of you who gifted these flowers to us today, we thank you for uh, helping us with our worship by making those donations. And we do invite you to take them with you following worship today if you have given one. And I think we have enough, so if you haven't given one but really wanted to, um, there is still time. If you're a guest of ours here today, we offer a special welcome to you today and hope that you will join us downstairs for a time of refreshment and fellowship after worship. Uh, There are hot cross buns and, and other goodies and hot coffee, so please, please join us downstairs following worship today. Let us continue in our worship. During this season of Lent and this last week in Holy Week, we focused on growing gardens, tending the life that is right in front of us, rather than constantly climbing ladders of what this world wants us to define as success. We've been embracing good enough lives and good enough selves that are worthy of love, no matter what. We've been acknowledging the suffering that is a natural part of life, and we've practiced compassion as we deal with the realities and limitations that invite us to let go of perfectionism and the incessant drive toward something else. We are here today to remember that the good gardener is with us, always tending us, always abiding with us, always there beyond any kind of death that we might face as we walk this crooked path called life.
Let us call on God as we pray together. Holy One, you whose love endures forever, you keep offering us new life and hope, no matter what. We praise you, for you are our strength and our salvation. We shall not die, but live, for you call us into the light, encouraging us to reach for the sun, unfurl our colors, and know that we are held in the deep and rich soil of your garden. This is more than good enough for us. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we sing hymn number 216, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Easter is tricky when it comes to faith. We come for the happy ending, the, and then they lived happily ever after. 
The resurrection story proclaims hope over despair and life over death. Yet we know that life continued and continues for us as a story of spiking heartbreak moments that are not forever fixed. The nature of being created for love is that we will always hunger for more, but there is never enough life and love to satisfy, and endings are too often too soon. But perhaps a good enough faith is one that moves through the chaotic nature of being incurably human with an eye for resurrection moments that assure us that this good enough life is worthy of our amazement. I invite you to imagine in this silence the deep seed and shoot that is growing within you, yearning for light and life. Hear this compassionate word from the prophet Isaiah. I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Know that already, already, God is offering us freedom from the fear of isolation and anguish at endings, inviting us to community and creativity for birthing new life, unexpected life, unending love. And know that despite our sometimes faltering steps, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are being forgiven even now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. Let us listen for the word of God. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered a curse. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be 
and my chosen shall live, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food, shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Let us listen also for the word of God as it comes to us 
in the Gospel according to John in the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at his head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. For these past seven weeks, we have been talking about change. After all, change is kind of what Lent is all about, right? One of the words that we often hear during Lent is repent. It's kind of a churchy word. John the baptizer starts, off, starts us off with these words at the River Jordan. Repent, turn around, change what you are doing, he says. This is not working, he says. Not exactly. And then we get this message that makes us think that we need to improve ourselves because we're just not worthy. We need to be more, to be better, to be more faithful, more generous, more fill in the blank, less of us, but more. And this Lent, we've been talking about change, but in a different way. This Lent, we've been talking about stopping our unending climb up the ladder of success. The ladder of more and better. And we've been inviting ourselves to explore our faith, the one that's here and now, the one that is already with us. We've been kind of digging in a little bit. We've been turning the soil 
to uncover what we already have. With all its imperfections, with all its uncertainty, we've discovered that we have a faith that's actually good enough. We started out a long time ago, six weeks, seven weeks, acknowledging that perfection is impossible, but transformation isn't. We were reminded that ordinary lives like ours can be holy. We were reminded that in spite of most persistent efforts, some things are out of our control. That healing medicine can come from many places. We push back on the idea that we are the problem, that we are the source of all our troubles. We've reminded ourselves that we are fragile, but beautifully fragile, and that's okay. We've learned that we're a group project, that we're all walking this path together, that we are blessed regardless, and that no matter what, God is with us through it all. Hopefully, these have been challenges for us as we emerge from the wilderness of these past 24 months into a hopefully, please God, post-pandemic world. Please, oh please, oh please. As we were rehearsing this morning, Mike reminded us that it's been three years since we sang Easter together in this room. And it sounded beautiful. We are now easing our way back into what we think we remember was normal. Was it like that? Ever? We're regathering, we're remembering, we're letting go of some things, we're creating other new things. Hopefully we have discovered that who we are, that our life together, our faith, while maybe not perfect, is good enough. Good enough. And here we are at long last on Easter Sunday. I don't know about you, but it's always puzzled me why the disciples don't recognize Jesus on that first Easter day. Two disciples walk seven miles with him to Emmaus, talking the whole way, and they don't recognize him until they sit down to eat and break bread together. The disciples gathered in the upper room behind those locked doors don't recognize him, or at least don't believe that it's really him until he shows them his hands and his feet, the wounds. And it's the same story with Thomas a week later. We'll hear that next week. And until this week, until just this week, I kind of felt the same way about this story with Mary at the tomb in the garden. Why didn't she recognize who it was? John tells us that early in the day, while it was still dark, Brad, that's a clue, while it was still dark, Mary goes to the tomb to do what there was not time to do on Friday. To say goodbye one more time. To see his body. Early in the day, while it was still dark. John tells us 
in our New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which as we all know is the correct one. <laughs> I'm kidding. That Mary is weeping. But in the final devotion of her wonderful little book, Good Enough, Kate Bowler gives us a little more. Maybe even a lot more. How many of you read that last devotion? You'll go home and do it today though, right? <laughs> Kate Bowler takes it a step further, and maybe a couple of steps further, and she engages in what we might call a little midrash on this text. And for those of you who may not know, a midrash is sort of a rabbinic technique to um, maybe fill in some of the blanks of the, the words that have been handed down to us. Not, look, not just looking at what is said, but is what, what is left unsaid. Speculating on the things that are not necessarily in that original text but that might open the door to new possibility or clarity or meaning. And Kate says that in responding to the question of the angels in the tomb, that Mary is heaving through sobs. Heaving through sobs. Remember, John says she's weeping. I think there's a little difference there, heaving through sobs and weeping. Maybe not. But she says weeping is not, is not what's happening here. Mary is sobbing. Our friend Richard Swanson, who we read from, from time to time, says that Mary is wailing. Wailing. She's crying so hard that she can barely speak. She's crying so hard that she can't even catch her breath. She's crying so hard that everything she sees in front of her is a blur. You know what that's like, right? We've all been there. And it's not those first words out of Jesus' mouth that give him away. Not the why are you crying, why are you weeping. It's when Jesus speaks her name, Mary. And then she knows who it is. This Lent, we have talked about some hard things. We've talked about loss. We've talked about failure, about hurt and disappointment. Good enough, our theme for this worship series, hasn't been just throwing up our hands and saying, whatever. No. The truth is that this chronic condition of life that Kate tells us about throws us curveballs. We know this. And this Lent, we've allowed ourselves to acknowledge those broken places, to accept them for what they are. Another part of our life that all of us goes through at one time or another. And we've been reminded, and I hope you've heard it, that we are in this together. Hopefully we're not falling apart, wailing at the same time. 
But you know what? If we are, that's okay. God will be there with us. Even when we can, can barely speak, even when we can't catch our breath, even when the world in front of us is just a blur. When we can't quite make out exactly what's in front of us, and maybe especially then, we can know that God is here. That God is there in that place with us. Ready to speak our name ready to bind our wounds, ready maybe to plant something in us that might grow something new. I don't want us to leave here today and just remember that lovely ladder that was up front. I don't want this Lent just to be another box to check off. Well, that was fun. Let's move on. I mean, we have to move on, yes. But I want you to take something with you. So I hope every household that's here today got a pack of seeds. Did everybody get one? There's still some in the basket. If you want more, please help yourself. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, go buy yourself some seeds. <laughs> Send me the bill. Is that okay, Charlie? All right. Find a sunny spot in the yard. Find a beautiful bowl that you can put out on your deck. Plant your seeds. Nurture them. Water them. Watch them grow and bloom and fade. They will fade. Watch their seeds scatter for something else to grow in another season. Through this Lent, we have prepared the soil. It is ready. And the good gardener will be with us. And that will be good enough. Amen. As we prepare ourselves to worship God in prayer, I invite you to lift up names and situations that should be in our prayers this day and through this week. Lucille? The Les Wing family? Martha? Scott and Jim, and Wendy, yep. Heather and Kristen, excellent, congratulations. <laughs> Pray for those in authority. Yes. Kim and Doug. I invite your prayers for Sonny also today. For peace in, for Ukraine. Yes. David.
Let us pray. Oh, we're going to sing. Yes, thank you, Nadine. <laughs> Let's sing. You would think after seven weeks that I'd have an idea of the flow of the service better than that. It's <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Oh God, on this bright and beautiful morning, we are still one. Hallelujah and amen. We praise you for the relentless possibility of your unending love a love revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. In him you expose the futility of violence and hatred. In him you have broken the grip of death. In him you have given to us the gift of new, everlasting life, starting on those observing Passover and Ramadan, those who are beginning their Holy Week journeys today, and those whose Lenten journeys are ending. Give us the courage and determination to be builders of your righteous realm. Reveal in us and through us, again and again, each and every day, the love that never ends. Let there be joy in Jerusalem and peace and justice among the nations in Gaza and Palestine, in Ukraine and Yemen. May rivers of justice and righteousness flow through our nation, our cities, our towns. Be with those who govern us.
that the sounds of weeping and cries of distress be transformed into shouts of joy and laughter. Let infants grow and thrive. Let trans people live lives free from fear or persecution. Let the old dance like children and children live to old age. Make us bearers of healing and wholeness to all your hurting people. Hear us now as we speak the names of those who are in need of your never-ending love, your healing, your life-sustaining presence. Today we pray for Sonny, Jim, and Wendy, for Scott, for the Leswing family, for Kim and Doug, for Martha, Heather, Kristen. We give you thanks for new jobs, the new earth that you have promised, faithful caretakers of all creation so that we might be glad and rejoice in your presence forever. Hear our prayers, O God, for we lift them up to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us when our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is the time in our worship when we are invited to respond, to respond with a financial offering. We are not passing the plate. If you would like to leave a gift for Second Christian, there's a plate on the table that you um, may place your offering in on the way out. If you're worshiping with us online and have found a home at Second Christian, we invite you to visit our website and make a safe and secure donation there. You can actually do that from your phone while sitting in the pew here today. the work of peace and justice in our world today, I invite you to give to them. If there is an organization that has your heart doing good things in this world, I invite your gift to them as we listen to the gift of music.
let us bless our gifts. Generous God, in response to your extravagant blessings, no matter what the state of the world or our imperfect lives, we offer our gifts and ourselves and know that you transform what we plant into the produce of love. Amen. Please be seated. I, I would invite you to get your seeds out. Everybody has seeds, right? Oh, all right. The choir will get seeds soon. All right. Tom's going to hand out some seeds here real quick. This is a blessing for you who are being planted. Blessed are you who are buried, who feel stuck in the depths of grief and despair, or who sit in the pit of unknowing. You are learning to trust the timing of a tender gardener. Blessed are you who are growing, you who burst with new life, fresh creativity, you who understand the pain that sometimes comes with stretching and changing, pruning and being cut back. And blessed are you in your season of fruitfulness. You who are learning to abide in the vine and who taste the sweetness of God's loving kindness. The God who was there all along, planting, waiting, watering, pruning, delighting. The God who pays careful attention to God's garden blesses you this day and always. Our closing hymn is number 638. In the bulb, there is a flower.
Please be seated. And now may the God who loves all of creation, especially the gardens we call our lives, and Jesus, our companion along this crooked path called life, and the Holy Spirit who loves to improvise in surprising ways, go with you, dwell among you, and give you joy this day and always. Amen. God is t-